Have you ever wanted to buy a tank but worried about ruining your driveway? Well, I did, and that's why before you, you see this Polish got R2M APC. And yes, I know it's not a tank. Today, I'm planning to give a high level overview of it and maybe show you the startup sequence a bit later. So, first of all, you're looking at a 1966 Scott R2M previously owned by the Polish Army. Its Czech name is the OT-64 and was jointly developed by the Polish and the Czechs during the Cold War period. It was meant to be an equivalent of the Soviet BTR. Visibility out the front, I've got to be honest, is not great. There's a tiny little windscreen and you can see the little windscreen wiper there. And that's all you've got to see out the front. It's not too bad when you're on a motorway and you just look at the lane in front, but if you're looking at diagonals on a roundabout, it's pretty awful. And having a co-pilot is absolutely essential. Not that you'll be able to hear your co-pilot. The engine compartment is directly behind the driver's compartment and in front of the passenger compartment. So the drivers and passengers are divided. Because the engine is directly behind the drivers, it's impossibly noisy. And even shouting at idle to your co-pilot is pretty difficult. There are of course radios fitted for each place, but I don't have any of that working in mine yet, so I fitted a temporary system designed for rally cars. In terms of drivetrain, it has a huge Tartra 928 engine with a 6-speed pre-select gearbox. That's an 11.5 litre air-cooled V8 diesel, pumping out just 180 brake horsepower. Drive is permanently at the rearmost wheels, and you can select the other three axles via air switches just to the left of the driver. The pre-select gearbox means you select the gear you want next with the lever to the right of the driver, but it doesn't change until you push the clutch pedal down and release it. It takes a bit of getting used to, but with practice it feels pretty normal. Did I mention it's amphibious? Look, it's got propellers, and rudders too! There are a few videos of these in lakes, but there's also some of them sinking, so I'm not planning on swimming in mine just yet. Before it goes into the water, there's a barge board at the front that needs to come down. The propellers are then activated with an air switch to the left of the driver, and the lever diverts hydraulics from the power steering to the hydraulically activated rudders. The water level is about 80% up the side when it's in a lake, and the exhaust have special flaps that have to be pulled tight to limit the water flowing into the engine bay. Thankfully, there's a really good bilge pump permanently running off the engine, so any water that gets in gets pumped out really quickly as long as the engine's running, of course. One other cool feature that's worth talking about is the central tyre inflation system. There are eight control valves in the centre of the driver's compartment that allow you to individually control each tyre pressure. There's a lever, powered by a dedicated compressor, that then lets you inflate and deflate the tyres. On mine, it's only working to the hubs. I need to reconnect the tube from the hub to the tyre valve and find some of the original covers for those tubes. There's also an NBC that's nuclear, biological and chemical, air filtration system pumping air to the drivers and to masks for each of the occupants in the back. It takes air in from just behind the driver's door, through the filter and into a common pressurised rail where the occupants in the back plug their masks in. My particular Scott is the R2M variant. That means it has a turret sporting the KPVT 14.2mm gun and the coaxial 762 PKT and it also has the passenger area stuffed full of radios and a 30 meter telescopic antenna. Where normally you'd find the personnel section, in mine there are five seats for radio operators and of course one for the gunner. Well, that's probably about enough talking for now. How about I start this thing up and turn it around ready for the next trip. Hey puppy. Hello, girl. You're going to have to move. Yeah, it's coming back. Okay, today's challenge. I'm going to test if the power steering is working on this, and the uh, ultimate test, of course, will be turning it around. So I've shuffled some cars out of the way. Got just enough space the other side of the Range Rover to turn around. So let's get her started up, get some air pressure running, and then start reversing. It's kind of cozy in here but startup sequence so we uh, put the throttle on, start the fuel pump and the ignition, put the key in 
we don't need to turn it, just putting it in and the light comes on. And then we can start. fuel pump run for a little bit longer actually but you can smell the diesel coming out so uh, so it is going let's uh, have a look out the back while we're doing this she wants to go. You smell a bit of smoke, probably you could see it. Let's give that one more go. I did mention it was noisy in the driver's compartment, didn't I? I'm shouting at the camera here, but you can't hear anything I'm saying. I'm pointing at the gauges for the two air cylinders. Nothing's going to work on this, including changing gear, until those come up to the blue section between 5 and 6. So now it's just waiting for the engine to build pressure. Here I'm just pointing at the oil pressure gauge, which seems to be a tiny bit high, but it's cold and oil is thick, so I'm sure it'll come down.
okay. I clearly have some repair work to do before I hit the roads again. I hope you found this video interesting. Please comment anything else you'd like to know about it or see and I may eventually get round to doing another video. Till then, cheers.